My first carp was caught on a, a hook, umbel eyes, and a bunch of olive marabou. That's why I even caught a, a koi, a, a, probably like a 20 pound koi. I, I don't care to say it. I don't care to say it. Rainbow trout are stupid fish. Now, if you're getting into some other fish, there are some definitely picky fish out there, but rainbow trout are not one of them. But before that flood, uh, the Norfolk of the White was had very possibly some of the best wild rainbow trout fishing in the Midwest. And I'll throw that out there. Um, I'll, I'll say that and I'll stand on it. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. Today we have a special guest, Brian Wise, the man behind Fly Fishing the Ozarks. If you're a fan of fly fishing, you've likely come across his YouTube channel where he shares expert tips and fly fishing tutorials. His passion for the sport and dedication to teaching others has made him a true leader in the fly fishing community. We're happy to dive into his journey and learn more about his passion. How you doing, Brian? I'm great. So your channel is Fly Fishing the Ozarks. So you're up in Missouri, up in the, yes. at the northern part of the Ozarks, me being in Arkansas, I'm on the lower end of it. Not quite in the Ozarks, unfortunately, but uh, is that something that, like, are you from there originally? I, I, I'm originally from Kansas City. Um, oh, so nice. I, I get a lot that, you know, you don't, you don't sound like you're from that part of <laughs> the world. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's probably most of it. But, but I, I've been here for, for a very long time. Uh, I'll say that. this is home for sure. Nice. And I just realized I forgot to mention that Marco's with us today. So, <laughs> so Jose is not with us. So our uh, other buddy that has been on the podcast, I think like 27 times or something like that by this point is uh, joining us. So we've got Marco and Brian with us. Um, so you said that you've lived there for quite a while. Have you been fishing the whole time there? Uh, not, not really. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I really didn't start fishing like really hard other than like some pond stuff around here and, and stuff like that as I was growing up until I was in like early college. I really? I really didn't fish much, even with spinning gear. And I hadn't picked up a fly rod at that point. So I see. Um, and that's, that's kind of what got me wrong. I'm, I'm not one of those that had, that grew up fly fishing and tying flies and, and stuff like that. I, I'm not, um, I'm one that, a lot of people kind of consider that, you know, they, that came to it later in life, later in life. I was, I guess I was 20 or something like that. So it's been like, gosh, it's pushing 25 years now, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, it, it's just that I, I'm not one of those that's done it forever. And yeah, I'm just not. <laughs> well, you're in similar company cause, uh, both Marco and myself are, uh, late onset fly fishermen. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I started fly fishing when I was 22 ish, maybe. Um, so, and then Marco, what you were like 30, 30. Yeah. I was yeah. 30 when I picked it up, saw some buddies doing it. And I was like, the, the, the funny story, and I'm, you know, long story short, um, the first time I ever fished, I was 21. I never knew it, never knew anything about it. Watched it. Movies thought that, you know, not, not to get sad or anything, but I thought only people with dads did that. I didn't have my father <laughs> growing up. Same, um, pretty much. But I just, that, that was normal. It's like, oh, you got a dad, you fished. And then a buddy of mine invited me fishing on the San Marcos one day. And we had just walked up to the river and somebody was actually fly fishing. And, you know, it was, it, it was, uh, it was bizarre to me. So the first question I asked, I go, what is that? And he goes, it's fly fishing. And the thought that came to my head was somebody somehow, Mr. Miyagi style caught a fly, tied it on to, I don't know how they did it, but that was just my thought process. They tied it on to a leader and they just kept casting it out to catch fish. And I didn't understand it. I didn't stop to understand it. I didn't stop to ask about it. I just walked my path and kept staring at the guy doing it. He was just false casting a lot. That's what I remember. And I remember it being a beautiful scenery. Uh, um, and then years later, I uh, did a couple bass tournaments with a friend of mine. And he had a fly rod with him and I started asking questions, watched them catch fish on it. And I was like, I've got to do this. And I did it. And I haven't looked back, honestly. I, 
it's, it's, uh, it's been one of the biggest helps for learning patience. Um, you know, learning how to think before you make a move. Um, it's, it's really helped me grow a lot as a, as an adult. I really do wish I had found it at a younger age. I think I would have been on a different path, but then again, I can't complain on the, the path that I'm currently on right now. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. So, um, yeah, I can honestly say that fly fishing has saved my life. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I had a, I had a art teacher in high school that was, uh, phenomenal, this, uh, pen and, or pencil and paper kind of artist, kind of, you know, that kind of guy, very realism type of stuff. And, he was a fly fisherman. So mm -hmm. I, I had talked, I remember talking to him about it and just kind of, it, it was intriguing. Um, but I had no idea. He ended up teaching me how to tie pretty much my first fly, like uh, several, obviously several years after that. And so like, it's pretty cool to, to look back at somebody that was in my life who I really like put on this pedestal. He was, he was just the, the greatest guy. He's still the greatest guy. And to, he's the one that got me started. If it wasn't for him, you know, none of this other really, really cool stuff that I've been able to do would have been there. I, I There's no way it would have been there. And yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it's funny how life paths and, and fishing and how fishing can tweak life paths. And I, I think Absolutely. it's awesome. Oh, for sure. So when he got you into fly fishing or fly tying, what was it? Did you start tying streamers or did you start with small stuff? <laughs> no, my first one was, was probably the same one that 95% of people did was I, I tied a woolly bugger. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was the olive woolly bugger and I had two pieces of crystal flash in the tail and, you know, um, <laughs> I'd kill to have that fly right now. Um, right. But you know, I, I didn't start tying any of the big, I, I was, you know, to be honest with you, I guided, um, for, for 20 years, uh, right oh, wow. at 20 years. So, um, you know, my bread and butter for the most part while guiding was, was nymphs and, and mm -hmm. soft tackles and, you know, and stuff like that. So yeah. that's, I did a lot of that tied tens and thousands of, of those, that type of fly and, and, you know, and then the big stuff, the big, big stuff came a little bit later. <laughs> I see. So did the big stuff come after you started filming yourself or did you kind of start filming yourself because of the big flashy stuff? I, actually, um, the, the, the big stuff is what really s kind of started it. I like, um, if you go way back on my channel, I think, um, cause I had a previous channel before this too, that we can talk about that. <laughs> had some great stuff on it, but, um, I, I, I started off like having, um, this was before, like you could, you could just take like a, a DSLR or your phone and film stuff that was worth anything. Okay. So yeah. I'm aging myself here, <laughs> but, um, I had this, I had this little underwater point and shoot camera that shot, I think it was like 460 video, like oh wow, bad stuff. But it shot video and it shot it underwater. Um, yeah. and, and it took photos underwater. So I would make, at the end of every season, uh, spring, summer, fall, I would make um, a like a slideshow that had a little bit of video in it. And I put it on YouTube for, you know, for an advertising type of thing. I see. And then that kind of morphed into having my, my... Uh, my guiding stuff and, and cameras coming in and videos on your video on your phone and stuff like that popped in. So, I mean, that was, a, that all kind of morphed out. So I was doing that a little bit before I really started doing any tying videos, but I see um, a trip up North chasing musky, like we just talked about earlier. Uh, I knew I was going to make a video of this trip and for like a, a teaser, I tied this huge musky fly <laughs> and sped it up. And, um, and I, th I think I set that to like cake, uh, the distance. If you, <laughs> if you know that, so you guys are probably too young to know that song, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, and then it just morphed into slowly morphed into what it is now. And yeah, I, see. I did not, that's not what I was planning to do by any means. So a musky trip turned into 
where you are now, yeah. <laughs> essentially. That's that that's is awesome. that's that's what it is. Yeah. So, do you fish for muskie often? Not as often as I want to, and and if I did, I wouldn't have a family. I wouldn't right. have a job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this the YouTube thing would be gone. It, if if I had muskie outside my front door, <laughs> I'd be homeless. Uh, right, I'd be homeless. Right. <laughs> That's one fish I, that I want to chase. I've only I've fished for northern yeah. pike in Alaska and I've fished for pickerel here in, in central Arkansas. Um but muskie is one that I, I want to get out there and chase for sure. There are different beasts. What do they what do they call this fish? Uh, fish of a thousand casts or ten thousand yeah. casts? Yeah. Uh, so like a buddy was from Wisconsin. Um, he just moved back. He would tell me countless stories about muskie, and he was completely obsessed with them. Um, he picked up fly fishing before he left here. So I, I worked with him on his cast. Not that I'm a cast instructor or anything like that, and you know my cast can always use work. Um, but I have been able to pick up some good information from some really good people. I mean, some good folks around here that can cast. Okay. So, um, I passed along what I knew. I'm like, look, man, I don't expect the best out of me, but expect to walk away being able to at least cast 20 feet at the very minimum, you know? And, uh, he picked up a five weight, then an eight weight. And he's like, man, we're moving back to our, uh, to, um, I'm sorry, to Wisconsin. And I was like, well, man, take those fly rods and you've got something new to learn up there now. I mean, you had count. I mean, he'd go out after gar here and he'd catch big gar on the conventional and he was really, really good at conventional. But I think he was looking for more of a challenge. And um, I think one conversation we had was comparing hunting. He was a big, he's a, he's a big hunter, um, rifle and archery. And I said, if I have to put it into perspective, I'm not much of a hunter myself, but I did tell him a story. And I said, you know, one, one day it kind of just clicked in my head that conventional to me is, is almost like rifle hunting long range. You can really make long casts. Um, you can be far back and, when it comes to archery, it's like fly fishing. I mean, you're up close, you're sight casting, you're being more careful, more quiet. And I think it clicked to him immediately. And he's like, I got to get a fly rod. And he did. <laughs> and, um, I, I mean, they just got up there and they're just getting settled in, but he's, I mean, he's like, dude, I got to get you up here. Yeah. I got to take you musky fishing. And, uh, he's told me some cool stories about doing figure eights in the water and whatnot. Besides that, I don't know much else about musky. I've never really looked into him since we don't have him locally. Yeah. It's just, you know, I, I don't feel like it's a waste of info, but I'm just, I'm like, what am I prepping for? What am I going to get myself excited for if I can't even chase them? <laughs> right. So <laughs> they are, they, they really, really are a different beast. I, I, yeah. They're, they're just different. Yeah. I was surprised the first time that I caught a pick roll because I was expecting, like, the, the thing that gets me is the take is so aggressive. But once you have them hooked, they're just kind of like, uh, you know, like you just gotta, oh. gotta bring them in, you know. I don't know about musky, but when it comes to pickerel, they, they're, the take is where it's at. And then when you bring them in and then when you're getting them off is when it's another battle. But like oh, the fight right. in between, I was kind of like, eh, I expected more. <laughs> <laughs> musky are, um, musky, the eat is, it, it's obviously the, like the main thing, but yeah, like if you, you've never had such violent side to side, to side head shakes as you'll get out of a muskie. Uh, like really, I, I, I've never seen anything so violent. Uh, I just, yeah, it's, it's violence. It's not, <laughs> there's, there's no other way to explain it. it they are violent predators oh. and they are freaking awesome. <laughs> Making me want to go up there like four hour drive oh, yeah. now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said there's musky about an hour north of him and I'm about yeah. three hours, three and a half hours from him. So uh, that might be worth the drive someday. I'd probably have to take a guide though, because I'm not going to drive all the way up there and I wouldn't have a chance <laughs> myself. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. but that is awesome. So at what point did the YouTube start transitioning from, Oh, you know, I just did this one to where it's like, Hey, you know, I can do something with this and I'm going to start tying consistently. Right. Um, I, I can almost, if I, I, if I knew when Gallup's sex dungeon came out, I could point to a gal- a calendar and say, right then, like, I see like that was, that was, that was what got me really rolling into it. Like we, we fished big stuff for mm. uh, maybe a couple years before we we really jumped into like the tying side of it uh it, it and, and it sounds crazy but it was such a it was such a new thing to us like the basically we're just gonna we're only gonna go throw big flies at these trout and mm-hmm. and see if we can move something and, and it's an if you know so yeah. 
we were figuring the fishing part of it out. I think a lot more than the tying side of stuff. It wasn't like this perfect, you know, seesaw of we're, we're figuring things out as we go. It was more of the fishing side of it. So, um, it, when I saw the, the sex dungeon the first time, I was just like, whoo, I, I, I like that. So I just kind of sat down and then, um, I, I work very closely with Feathercraft out of St. Louis. And, I see. Um, so whenever all those flies started filtering in up there, they were like sending some to me and, and stuff like that, like before they would come out on the shelves and I would, I'd get a chance to, to, to look at this stuff. And so then that kind of spurred on like, well, maybe I'll start, start tying these flies and figuring these flies out <clears throat> and then do some videos because it really kind of, I, I don't, I don't give myself credit for very much at all. Um, but the whole sped up thing, I honestly can't say I saw it on YouTube before my videos. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm not saying I'm the first one to ever do anything like that or anything like that, but I just didn't see it in fly tying before my videos. Yeah. So I thought, and you know, you had all these guys back then on YouTube that were, you know, <laughs> I, I hate to put it this way, but they were just kind of boring. And, and, you know, here's how you wrap thread on a hook. And <laughs> that, I, that does not keep my attention at all. So I wanted to make something that was fun um, and something that was different. And, and, and I did, I, I, I completely succeeded at that. I, I made something completely different than anybody else was doing. Uh, I set it to stupid music that I don't even like. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, just did all that stuff. And, and that's, that's what, and then it, it, it just rolled. And so the Gallup flies were that, that main series, you know, like the boogeyman and the dungeon and, uh, the, the barely legal and, and all those, those main flies were the ones that really kind of got it rolling. And, and I see. Yeah, and then I just went from there. And, and I can't say that, uh, what drew me to your videos when I first started watching videos trying to learn how to tie is I would see the duration and I would see the flies and I was like oh well he's tying this you know big articulated fly and his video is six minutes long and then you got this <laughs> other guy for 32 minutes to tie a freaking prince nymph like right. and then you would start right. and and they would just okay and then you gotta do this and then yours is like straight to the point this is what you do the actual wraps are, are sped up. So it was kind of, that's what drew me to you. Cause it's like, I'm trying to get as much information as I can so I can do it. You know, I'm not trying to sit here and relax. I'm trying to get some stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I think that's what drew me to your videos in the first place, that, and then also the bright colors. There's not very oh. many fly time videos out there back then that, you know, it was all, you know, natural match the hatch type of stuff. And yours always seemed yeah. to be, you know, brighter colors. Um, is that intentional or is that just mainly what you like to fish or? it's, it's very intentional. Um, <laughs> I'm, well, I, I say that, um, the, the, the color I end up landing on is, is usually going to be something that's, that's bright unless it, unless it's, unless it lends, it, it doesn't lend itself to being bright. Uh, there's mm -hmm. some flies that you can tell by the profile that, that they're meant to be a sculpin and I just can't make a chartreuse over, purple <laughs> skull. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, there are, but you know, I, I, I try to, uh, you know, as a, as a YouTube thing, it's, it's unfortunately, uh, I do try to figure, try to find something that's kind of bright and it sounds like it worked at least for <laughs> in your case. Yeah, it did. <laughs> so, um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of think a lot of the people that watch my stuff are just like, 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 squirrel you know they're yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's me because i am a thousand percent <laughs> like that <laughs> oh, yeah. that's awesome so uh, i guess the thumbnails obviously play into kind of what colors you're going to use and what you land on but do you ever have like expectations when you're going into making a video do you ever get burnt out because you feel like oh i gotta put this video out or do you feel pressure like that i do i, I absolutely do. that's the first time i've ever had that question in a podcast um <laughs> i i do uh, there there are times when um when you might see me not throw a video out for a couple of weeks i mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to do that one a week type of thing um yeah. it 
you know, the, the videos I do, um, uh, being an editor yourself, I, I think you'll appreciate this. I typically in my, my product spotlight videos, the ones where I actually talk and you can see me, um, mm-hmm. I, I have a re- typically around 150 to 230 jump cuts. Oh, wow. So yeah, in a, in a 12 minute video, I'll have That's that many insane. Yeah. So, so the editing on my end and I edit all my videos as well. Um, so the editing on my end is, is, is pretty harsh, is, especially on the product imagine. spotlight videos. Um, so, so I do, I, I'll, I'll get burnt out every once in a while and, and do that. I, I always, I always still get my, you know, I, I do one a month, one fly tying video a month. Um, mm-hmm. I'll do two to three other product spotlight videos or tying tips videos or something like that. But the, the fly tying video, I, I will always have one a month, just always. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> man, I, I definitely feel that I, I go through a little bit of burnout myself in this. Cause I also do. So we have two YouTube channels. We have the wildlife outdoors podcast channel, which is what we're doing here. And then I have wildlife outdoors, which is more of a travel vlog kind of video. I'm trying to get more into like documentary style. Um, but those are the ones that take so long because there's more artistic touch to it. And you know, I got to make sure that I, I get the B roll lined up perfectly. And I'm still learning yeah. myself. Like I am very new to film and very, very new to, to editing. And so whenever I'm doing those videos, there's a lot of cuts, a lot of putting B roll together and then trying to sequence it out. And then you know, of course, color grading and all that. It's just so new to me. And when it comes yeah. to these interview videos, like basically I stack the tracks and then I go and I just cut people out. You know, I'll layer them and I'll put the one that talks the most up top and then, you know, second and third. And that way I can just cut, which like the person that's talking the most for the little section that he's not talking, I'll just cut that out. And so it's easy to just kind of layer it. And I've kind of gone through a system to where I can probably edit an hour video and probably two and a half hours total. I work on it 30 minutes after I put my daughter to sleep and get it done in a week. And I put out an episode every other week. So I kind of have a system with that, but it just gets so boring and then it's It's like i want to get on the artistic stuff yeah exactly (laughs) and then i want to get to the artistic stuff but then i'm so burnt out from the youth from the interview stuff so it's just trying to find that balance it's what's difficult (laughs) but it it is fun and i do enjoy doing it it's just i don't want to overdo it you know what i mean (laughs) right right i love editing i really do i i i like editing i like i like a i like little stuff Sorry, my phone is going nuts. I thought I turned it on. <laughs> Hang on. Great. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. So to kind of get off the YouTube stuff, uh, kind of want to talk a little bit more about fly tying. So do you have any favorite or least favorite materials to work with? Yeah. So like as far as favorites, I there's there's I, I honestly truly believe there's no way I could just pick one. I mm-hmm. I, I I don't. I um, right now I'm working with bucktail a lot. Um, so right now I love bucktail and I, I take that back. I always love bucktail, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, <laughs> if I, if I had to pick like a top three, I would be somewhere around like bucktail and marabou and probably something like laser dub, you know, just, mm-hmm. I can, you know, I feel like I can make a fly out of that. Those so things. versatile. You can use those for everything. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. My first carp was caught on a, a hook, dumbbell eyes, and a bunch of olive marabou. Yeah. I don't doubt that at all. Who would have, who would have thought? I mean, I, it didn't <laughs> look anything like it was a bass fly that was given to me. And, um, I just happened to see a carp right at the time and made a cast and I watched this thing just come up and slurp it. As it was sinking, I mean, I was maybe a couple inches under the water already, and uh, I was I was kind of in awe. I was like, "That's not normal," <laughs> you know. We're talking about this this past year too. This is my first car. Oh, wow! I, I didn't been pro- proactively chasing them very often, but um, the times that I did get out and try to, you know, just target that the carp, uh, I wasn't very successful at it. Uh, but um, yeah, it was, it was it was interesting. Marabou has this funny way of dancing in the water it's it's beautiful yeah. it never uh, stops breathing ever right 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 do you have much carp up there in missouri <clears throat> oh yeah yeah I ours love are, I, swear, I swear ours are like ghosts well i'm not like ghosts they're they they're the spookiest things 
Uh, mm-hmm. Just so hard to to actually get a hold of. Oh, they, they drive are. me crazy. I tried for years, and two years ago, no, last year was the first carp I've caught, and I've caught probably 10, 15 since then. But they uh-huh. come and breed like 50 feet <clears throat> from where I'm sitting right now. I live on uh-huh. the finger of Lake Hamilton, and they come out here and breed in the springtime when they raise the lake back up. And I went out there, and I targeted them one year, and, and I foul hooked one by mistake, and that was the only one I caught that year. And then I last year was I was fun. able able to oh it was it was like thirty something pounds too on an eight weight like it was nuts and then I I foul hooked it in the tail and so it was just going um, and it took me about probably fifteen minutes to get it in and I had to resuscitate it for another fifteen um, but then last year I started targeting them a lot and I was able to be quite successful I even caught a, a koi a, a, probably like a twenty pound koi um, oh, a bunch cool. of carp. And, um, they're so fun to, so fun to chase in general, but they are extremely yeah. spooky. And, uh, I don't remember what episode it was, but recently someone was saying that they have one of the most sensitive lateral lines of any fish out there. So oh, that's wow. probably why. And they have really good eyesight. And so, um, we did an episode a while back about carp. Yeah. yeah. I, it would make a lot of sense. The lateral line would make a lot of sense just simply because of how, uh, like, like on the lower part of my, my home river, uh, they'll move in a little bit and mm-hmm. you can't cast in the same mile that they are in without, without them spooking it. There yeah, it's most right. incredible thing. So the lateral line thing would make perfect sense. Yeah. It's insane. I went and I was fishing for, uh, there was common carp and smallmouth Buffalo on the Illinois river in Oklahoma a couple months ago. I actually made a video on that that I released recently and they are ridiculously sensitive and i mean i'm trying to cast to them and it's like if i fl- if i don't lay my fly line out if it makes any type of vibration on the top of the water boom they're gone off into yeah. the deep water i was like oh this is so tough but they're so <laughs> fun and once you actually hook them i mean just that fight it, it, and it's weird because they're not it's not an aggressive fight it's just like they're so big and strong it's like well let it do its run and then fight yeah. it in and typically have two or three good runs out of them and oh, they're just so much fun they are <laughs> they really are so your favorite materials, your, your top three of those, what are your least favorite materials to use? I was really trying to think about that. <laughs> like, I don't even know. I, like, I <laughs> I'm, I'm not a huge fan of um, like the really thick, uh, uh, basically, oh, I hate to put it this way, but all the game changer stuff, like mm-hmm. the the real thick game changer stuff, I'm not a fan of. Um, yeah, I, I I I just don't I don't love it. But um, I I but I've used it and I've used it a lot. <laughs> so you're talking about I, like that I, poly body I, stuff. Yeah, the, and it, yeah. it makes a real thick body, mm-hmm. and I it I just I just don't love fishing it. So I think yeah. that's why I don't, I just don't use it. But I mean, tying with it's okay. I, there's no way I could give you three materials that I just hate. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I don't think you could several years ago. Um, I would have jumped to deer hair in a heartbeat. It would really? have, it, like it, before you got the question out of your mouth, I would have said deer hair. I <laughs> despise it. Uh, now I'm really, sitting at the moment. I, I I love it. It it's it took me a long time to really really get to love it, um, but I, I guess I, I forced myself to sit down and tie uh, several dozen of one fly mm-hmm. and trim them out. So I, I tied them all, and then uh, I didn't trim them. I just kind of set them aside, and then I went back and trimmed them, and that was the best way I could have learned period like yeah it, that way if you do it that way then you you know you get some of that muscle memory start to build and then mm-hmm. when you go back to do it it'll do it again and and then when you do them all at once it it really sets in so that's yeah. that, that was the <clears throat> best thing that i ever did for deer hair i highly recommend if if anybody has problems ever everybody has problems with deer hair yeah, <laughs> at some point has problems with deer hair. It, when you when you decide you're going to make a a deer hair popper or something like that, seriously, sit down and tie three dozen of them, and then go back and trim them, 
and you will be so much better off. If you look at your first one compared to your 36th one, you, it's, yeah, that, that will fix. I'm not going to say it'll fix all your problems because I still cuss deer hair. Right. Like, <laughs> two out of three flies, I'm going to cuss <laughs> when I right. tie with deer hair. But it's, you know, before it was every, every rap, I was, I yeah. was cussing deer hair. So uh, it's not quite as bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> deer, deer hair is one of those things where it's like, there's such a learning curve. You know, if you're using marabou yeah. or dubbing or bucktail or really anything else, you can wrap it on there and it's quite forgiving. But when it comes to deer hair, whether you're spinning it or stacking it, it yeah. is just, it's, uh, there's such a learning curve. My, me, myself, I've tied maybe three or four with deer hair with like deer hair heads. And I just, I'm not a fan. It's so difficult. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I get discouraged. And then I break my, like, it's like, I finally feel like I got something going good. And then next thing you know, you break your thread. I'm just like, yep. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, my frustration with deer hair has been on the clouds or side of things. Um, finishing off by the, by the eye hook or the eyelid, you know, um, I feel like I leave too much out and then trying to pinch it and hold it down while you're tying it down has been, it's been a big challenge for me, which has been enough to kind of draw me away from ever tying clousers and just buying them. Uh, same thing with the game changers. Game changers. Don't ask me to tie one. I'll never tie one. Anyone that's ever asked me, have you tied a game changer? I was like, no, I'll pay the $20 per game changer before I tie a game changer. Yeah. I just don't, I, I want nothing to do with it. Um, I, and then, I hate tying changers. Yeah. I hate tying. Yeah, they changers. look like a nightmare. They look like a nightmare. I just, I don't even want to get involved with it. That's, yep, that's yes, what that I've been told. True. They take so I've know, had the, a few of them. Yeah. So Jose actually corrected me recently as I was, um, uh, you know, I, I, I get into this fly tying and, um, I, I feel like maybe it, I'm at a point where maybe I start asking folks that tie a lot more than I do about different materials. Um, because at one point I was just cutting the bottom of the bucktails the whole time. And then as I tie them down, you know, they'd, they'd spread. Mm-hmm. And Jose's over here one night. We're having a little bit of bourbon. And I said, man, I, I've watched some of your fly. I mean, some of the flies he's gifted me. I look at them and I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And he goes, oh, yeah, just cut the top of it. And I'm like, what do you mean the top of the tail? I, I was trying to make sure, you know, I was, you know, like, here's a piece of bucktail right now. I mean, I was, I mean, you can see where I've cut pieces off of this right here. And that's where I was always going. I was always going at the bottom there, right? <laughs> And, and then now you see that the top's starting to get cut up. Right. And I, I had no idea. I thought I had to work my way up. You know? <laughs> and and, and it just goes back to say, if you don't ask, you don't know, right? So, yeah. Right. yeah uh, those uh, bottom hairs are a lot more hollow and they, they flare out. And right. They're useful. Right. Right. Exactly. I, I, I had no idea. I've got a, a, on my wall back here where I've got like just a bunch of stuff. I've got a, like a picture of a bucktail and it's Gunnar Brammer is the one that kind of built it, kind of put it together and then sent <laughs> right. it off to have it printed. And it, and it's so cool, but it's like, it's more for like the, the musky guys. And it says, yeah. you know, the bottom, the bottom's good for like bulkhead and reverse tying. And then the middle is good for, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the top is just meh. <laughs> but, but for musky guys, the top is just kind of like, eh, cause they want that, that flare. Yeah. They want to, they want right. to build a big fly. So that top doesn't flare. And they're like, eh, I don't want that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> they, those so musky flies, you want them to push water. Yeah. How cool I mean, would it be if, if somebody actually published the book that had, I mean, chapters of material and, you know, illustrations, like what you just said, like on a bucktail of, you know, what certain sections of that material will do as you tie it down onto a shank. Um, I think that'll be a, I mean, why wouldn't it sell? I, I'd obviously buy one. Oh, sure. Just because, I mean, there's stuff out there that <clears throat> I bit off more than I could chew when it came to fly tying. Um, my neighbor's a registered nurse and he gave me this huge medical cart one day and it had all these drawers and um, my wife made me promise to disinfect it before it came in the house. Cause she's like, those are a hospital. I don't know. You know it's, All right, that's fair. And he gives, he gives it to me and he's like, Oh, you know, I don't know if you could do anything with it. And that's where all my fly time materials at. Um, so, you know, I've got drawers, different sections and whatnot. It's, it's been a lot of help, but I bought more than I probably need. And I just dove off the deep end of it. Cause I said, you know, I don't want to be without at one point 
I don't want to tie a fly and say, hey, I didn't have this material. No. Oh, guess what? I bought it the other day because I figured I would have needed it. And it's been a lot of help. But I mean, I couldn't I couldn't add up the amount of uh, a fly material I I purchased. I think I have almost the same amount of collect, like the same amount that somebody that had been tying for, you know, consistently for 10 years. I probably <laughs> have the same amount of fly tying material. And <laughs> can I be honest with you? I haven't used it all. I mean, I have, there's, yeah. there's stuff that's still in packages that I've never touched. And, um, you know, I keep myself in the butt about it. I'm just like, man, get in there and tie, dude. Like, what's the worst that can happen? I've tied some pretty ugly flies and I've caught fish on them. So, <laughs> yeah, just do it. I, I've got a video in mind about ugly flies and catching fish. And, yeah. I mean, that's, that's like, yeah. Uh, every Fish are stupid. Let's just be honest. Yep. Fish are stupid, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> especially rainbow <laughs> trout. <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah. Especially I mean, stalkers. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't care to say it. I don't care to say it. Rainbow trout are stupid fish, and for them to be able to tell the difference, and you know, no, they don't. They just eat. Yeah. <laughs> A lot yeah, of it's so about the fly stupid. placement more than anything. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. For sure. And movement, and yeah, for yeah. sure. I totally and agree. and silhouette, of course, you know. Yeah. But yeah, when it comes to the actual materials and how they're moving and stuff like that, when it comes to rainbows, yeah, no. I mean, now if you're getting into some other fish, there are some definitely picky fish out there, but yep. rainbow trout are not one of them. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> so with all those different materials that you like, you don't like, is there any flies in particular that you prefer tying over others? Yeah. Yeah, there, there absolutely are. Like when I, uh, so I'm lucky enough that I, I've, I've designed two flies that, um, Montana fly company has, has take, I don't want to say taken over for me, but, um, but they're producing for me. Um, Is that the knuckle the deep, ability, the knucklehead? Yeah. The knucklehead and the knuckle deep. Um, and so, but I have the ability to, um, when I was first designing these flies, I didn't probably need to take a step back when I was first designing these flies and, and getting them, well, when they were done and ready to be produced, I was doing it myself. And mm -hmm. what I was doing was, um, I had, you know, like three different colors. So I was like commercially tying it mm -hmm. and I'm not a commercial tire. I'm the first to admit it. I am, I'm not an efficient commercial tire that is going to do well per hour. <laughs> I'm not. Um, so it doesn't work like that for me. I, I, I don't know if I'm too anal about things and, and stuff like that. I, I'm just not that good at that stuff. But what I started doing was like doing drops of colors that I thought were cool. And, um, it, you know, here are, you know, so many flies once they're gone, they're gone, and this color will never come back. Um, and it's so fun to do. And you get, I, I've I've gotten to talk to a lot of people and make some good friends that are doing that. And, they, and they're just like kind of collecting flies. And <laughs> so, but going back to, I take the long way around to answer your question. Just so you know. <laughs> but going back to your question, I I really I love tying double deceivers. I, mm -hmm. I could sit and tie double deceivers for days and which is what I've actually done. I've got a drop that's getting ready to come out but sometime. Um, <laughs> and, and I have, I, I've been tying double deceivers. They're Ronald McDonald colored double deceivers for, <laughs> for a while. And they're, they don't have that's any awesome. eyes on them. There was a little sneak peek, but, um, <laughs> but so, uh, so I, I, I will tie a double deceiver, like I said, for days. And I really, really like tying, uh, the knuckle deep specifically the, I, mm -hmm. I love, I love the knuckle head. It's my original, the one that, that, that I designed first as my first original fly and I love it, but I'd rather sit and tie a knuckle deep than, uh, than a regular knuckle head and a, and a double deceiver. I love double deceivers. I think it's, I think it's one of the greatest, big flies in the world period yeah yep very versatile too in terms of what you can catch on them oh yeah 
Yeah, oh yeah, you can catch anything on them. Yeah, yeah I, uh, really myself, I preferred tying articulate. I don't know what it. Maybe it's just the challenge, but I I enjoy tying articulated flies. Um, oh cool! But I have yet to try a knuckle deep or a knucklehead. So where where did uh, that idea come from? Well, um, so <laughs> going back to the the double deceiver, um, a, a double deceiver is uh, for, well the way I tie it, it's probably ninety five percent natural material. Okay, so mm-hmm. bucktail, schlopping, and I have a little bit of flash on the inside. So, um, but when you're using that much natural material, sometimes you'll get a fly that's that swims a little wonky. Uh, mm-hmm. It'll it'll instead of doing this and this, it'll do this and this and this, um, or it'll fall on its side. And and it, I got I, I was guiding a lot. And I got frustrated because I'd pull a brand new fly out that I had just, I'd tied myself mm-hmm. and, and tie it on. And, you know, the first cast, it lay over on its side or something. And it just got, I got, I got so frustrated, but by running into that one out of a dozen flies does that, you know, typically yeah. something like that. And with that, with that much natural material on a hook, you don't have perfect control over what, is going to happen. So yeah, there's some variability for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I started, I, I, I started thinking of ways to make a fly swim the way I want it to swim. And I know for a fact, it's going to do that every single time. And, uh, about that time, uh, Drew Chacon in, uh, Florida, he's a, a just a phenomenal fly tire and, and product designer, just the author. <laughs> I mean, he's just, he's awesome. Um, yeah. he had came out with this stuff called fettuccine foam. Well, actually before <clears throat> that, uh, he was, uh, he, he had designed this fly. It was a, it was a tarpon toad. It was a tarpon fly that had a, this crazy head that was made out of strips of foam. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, that's when I originally started tying the knucklehead. I saw that and I totally copped it off of him. I totally did. <laughs> I sent him a message. <laughs> I said, Hey, just so you know, I'm thinking I'm going to, I'm going to use your strips of foam idea to, to do an articulated pattern for trout, uh, specifically for trout and smallmouth and stripers and stuff. And he was like, that's awesome. Do it. And so I, I jumped on it and did it. And, um, so that uh, the, like the whole idea behind it is if, if you've ever seen one, if you haven't seen one, pull a picture up and, and go through this with me. So like I'll put one on the screen. Hey, nice. Um, so the, the foam on top of the head coupled with the, the bend of the hook, um, will, it, it can't fall over on its side. I see. It, it can't lay over on its side because the foam is going to, the foam wants to float yeah. while the weight of the hook wants to sink. And the foam is only on top. It's not all the way around the hook. So it has no choice. It has to swim correctly. It's, it's not going to fall on its side. It'll get pushed by side currents, which is really, really good. And one thing that I was really worried about in the design process of this, because I didn't want to take like pushy movement away from it by having this. And it Mm -hmm. totally didn't. So it worked out really, really well. It, that original, a knucklehead is, is my favorite swimming fly I've ever fished uh, the really? way it swims it. And, and you can throw it like a dart. You can throw it on a six weight. There's, they're, they're just really they're great flies. Yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. You can throw up, hmm. uh, they come in at f- just under six inches and you can totally throw that original on a six weight. Totally do it. That is aw- Yeah. I, I need to go pick some up. <laughs> you said uh, Montana fly company has them. They do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so how did that transition from the knuckle head to the knuckle deep? Uh, okay. So um, the knuckle head inherently is not a fly that is easy to get super deep. I mean, okay. it there's no weight to it. Uh, like I don't add any weight to the whole fly. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, it, you, you would think with the foam, it'll, it would want to float head up. And yeah. with the way the rest of the body works, it, it really doesn't. I mean, it's not a, it's not a thing. It's not like a perfectly suspending fly, but it's not something that, that wants to kind of float head up toward the surface. I um, but I did want something that was easier to get deep, you know, I, and rather than being forced to 
to go to a faster sinking fly line or to add weight to a leader, which I, I would hate for people to have to do. I made, yeah. I made the, the knucklehead with lead eyes and tied with uh, some more natural materials. Uh, mm -hmm. It's rabbit strips. So it, they, they soak up a little bit of water um, and they have the lead eyes. So it, it still has that ability. It still has that. It still does the exact same thing because of the, the head, it still wants to swim right, and it's going to swim right. Um, but it does; it do, it's a lot easier to get deeper, and, it, that's, and it's a little that bit smaller. Sense. It's a little bit more approachable. Um, I it, a lot of people fish it for smallmouth. I th I think it's probably more of a it's caught more smallmouth than the original knucklehead ten times over. I would be really. I'd be willing to bet. Hmm. And, and that is yeah, awesome. and, and since so hairline's doing a really cool thing of putting out like these crazy colored zonk rabbit strips. And mm -hmm. so you have this endless supply of crazy colors they can do. And yeah, so they're, they're fun. I, I like yeah. tying that fly. I really, really like tying that fly. <laughs> that, that mahi color they came out with was, <clears throat> is freaking awesome. I love that. That's thing. a cool one, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen it yet, Marco? I have not. I man, I haven't bought fly material since before before Columbia, to be honest with you. Really? I just purchased hooks for the first time in like a year today because we got a tournament coming up in Port O'Connor here in the next few weeks. So I was like, I better get my ass to tie again. Right. <laughs> it's coming up quick. So yeah, no, but yeah, no, I, as far as like keeping up with the, with the new stuff coming out, um, I'm not very good at that. Um, I think it's just because I got so much else, not, not that I have so much else going on, but I let my mind stray away from not necessarily the fly fishing, but the fly tying, you yeah. know, cause it's like, okay, well I, I can do it when I can do it. It's, I'm not going to say it's not a priority. It's always a priority to, to tie because I don't think anything makes me feel better about myself as an angler, a fly angler, especially than catching a fish on my own fly. Yeah. Cause it's like, Oh, maybe I do know what I'm doing. Maybe yeah. I don't. I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, no, I haven't, but, um, I am curious to what that looks like. So I'm going to look it up after we get off of this. It's, it's super So cool. basically it's a Zonka strip that it's okay. like, so you know what a Mahi, like how they're like yellow, yeah, blue yeah, and green. Definitely. So it's like yeah, basically yeah. the same color going from okay. the base to the tip and it's barred, right? It's barred, didn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. like, it's like a, it's like a yellow, green, blue barred rabbit song. Like, dude, it's pretty sweet looking. It is. <laughs> Man, it is awesome. That, that, uh. I, I can imagine a good like a uh, lunch money minute with something like that. You know oh, that I mean? would be that would uh -huh. be pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. for sure, that would be for awesome. sure. <clears throat> How do you so so? Let me ask you this: How do you feel? Um, me, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm five years into fly uh, fly tying, or four years into fly tying. Um, I feel like one of the biggest challenges for me, and I've talked about it to a lot of people, but never really asked anybody what their thought was on it. But brands and hooks, as far as you know, there's two ot, Gamakatsu, you got, you know, all these other brands. And I always thought it was weird that I'd see every brand size was almost different from each other. Oh, um, not just shank wise, but yeah, I, I never understood that. Maybe you guys yep. can clarify that or I don't know. No, nobody can clarify that. <laughs> no? Okay. So I don't feel, I don't feel uh, so lost. <laughs> no, you're dead on the money. There, There's a, in our sport right now, both on the fly fishing and fly tying side, there's a lot kind of going on with some talk about standards and because fly lines in particular um, have gone off the deep end, like the, the weights and grain weights, uh, th what I was taught forever ago um, has been thrown out the window two and three times now. Um, mm -hmm. so things are, things are weird and hooks are absolutely one of those weird things that, you know, you, you may, uh, you know, a lot of it may be, um, the style of hook. Uh, if you have, right. if you have the same style of hook, I think all hooks should be the same size. Period. Yeah, I agree. If it's, if it's, it's mustad, if it's gamakatsu, yeah. if, if it's a, if it's a two X long, two X heavy, you know, whatever straight shanked hook, it should be this size period. Yeah, right. I, the wire size, I understand the wire size can, can change and it's going to change, but mm 
Mm-hmm. Right. You sh- you should have this hook. I truly, truly feel that way. That is not the case. It's so far from the case that it's crazy. And we have all yeah. these crazy hooks now. It's it's really cool. Um, manufacturers are doing really cool things with hooks, but then yeah. it's I think it's creating that separation even more because of of how many cool things they are doing with hooks, and yeah. it's making right. it. I don't know. It's making it more transparent it's it's just weird i i i totally agree you're not going crazy <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole nother world for sure especially as a beginning yeah. fly tire you know you go and and you're oh, yeah. ordering from like jay stockard or something you have everything at your disposal and you're looking and you're like oh that was cool that was cool that was cool do i need that no no i got that so i don't need that it's just <laughs> there's so much out there and, you know little little tiny bends in the belly of this hook or this yeah. one's gonna be you know the eyes is, is sideways or the eyes yeah. not like yeah. there's just so many things <laughs> things to choose from jig style hooks and everything it's just yeah. so much to look at but then yeah. you got the variability of, of of size for what it should be because it's a different brand and yeah <laughs> it's tough for sure i i remember several 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 years ago there was a whenever whenever hooks were hooks you know because right. when i first started like my my early guiding days say the early 2000s it was it, there was it was way better than it is now Mm -hmm. way, way, way better than it is now. But there was one hook that, that ended up coming out that was super controversial. And, uh, it was, a, I think it was, I think it was a Timco 200 R or something like that, but it was just this, it was almost like a scud hook elongated and not quite as scuddy. If that makes any sense. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember having, I remember hearing people argue about that hook because they thought that the, the bend of the hook and how it, how it was bent was killing fish and, and all this stuff. And, and here I am like, like, are you serious right now? I, I, I love that hook cause it was a great stone fly hook. <laughs> so, and I used it all the time. So yeah, I remember it's scary, but I remember when that kind of hook was like super, super controversial. <laughs> yeah. And now we have these crazy hooks that are like all over the place. So, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe one of these days we'll see it go back. I doubt it. I'm not holding my breath. I, right, I, right. I don't ever see it going back to what it was. Well, I hope they come up with at least some, you know, type of standard where, you know, like yeah. you're saying, th- this size hook for this kind of hook should be this size, no matter what, what company makes it. So I agree with that. Totally agree. Yeah. So when it comes to designing your own flies, is there any advice that you would have for somebody that wants to start designing their own flies? Oh, um, don't rush. I mean, okay. the, the main thing, um, I think I had, I like to tell people that I had the knucklehead. Um, I had the thought of the knucklehead in my head for a couple of years. I just didn't have the ability to, mm-hmm. to do it. I, I didn't know what. I didn't know what was going to make it work, you know, until I saw what it needed, you know? So, yeah. So, you know, if you have an idea for something and, and you can't, you can't jump to it directly, let it simmer a little bit and, and things will start to fall in place on top of don't rush the process itself because Mm -hmm. it's frustrating. Actually, that's one of the most (laughs) frustrating things that, that I've done. I I tweaked the the original knucklehead. I tweaked it like hard tweaks. I probably did seven or eight, like complete hard tweaks. Uh, One of them was a, a, well, about a third of a redo, just a complete redo. It started off with a slop and tail. Um, I see. Hated it. I hated it. And, <laughs> and, and, and I'm such a slop and tail guy with the double deceiver that I was, uh, then I, I was dumbfounded. And then I went to Marabou and then I just completely settled on going to craft for body. And, and, and all this was over a process of, it was probably a couple of years. So I, I oh, probably wow. rolled on the knucklehead for four years. So I see. So, so, Take it slow, take it easy, but, but make sure that it's, it's your fly. Make sure it's your fly, make it your own and, and jump on it. And 
people are going to tell you that, it, oh, but it looks like this fly and it looks like this fly and eh, just let it roll off the back. It's, it's yeah. not a big deal. You see a lot yeah. of that. I kind of went through that when I first started yeah. tying. Yeah, you do yeah. see a lot of it. I tied up. I remember one time it was right after I got divorced. I went down and uh, me and my co-host, I'll say we hung out and we went out fishing, went back to the hotel I was staying at and we we're just going to tie flies and we were drinking some Modelo. And so we're tying up some stuff. And, and are you familiar with Matt Bennett's uh, lunch money and brunch money? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So we were tying up some lunch monies and I tied something that was kind of lunch money esque, um, some different materials, but the, the body shape, the, the silhouette of it was basically the same. And then I mixed up some dubbing that was like this, this olive, a little bit of olive. It had some Brown in it, some tan in it, and then some gold. And I tied it up and I made, you know, the upper part of the head out of that. And it had kind of the shape of a lunch money, but was a little different. And um, I called it the Modelo Minnow because we were drinking Modelo. And it was kind of the, the head ended up almost being like the color of the f- the foil on top of the Modelo. So oh, it was just nice. something I took a picture and I put it out there. It wasn't like I'm not trying to sell it. I'm not trying to mass manufacture them or anything. But I was like, you know, my first thing that I ever created that I consider something that I did artistically when it comes to fly tying and I wasn't going to try to market it, but I posted it and I got so many messages like, dude, that's yeah. just a lunch money. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, like fine. Yes. It looks like a lunch money. It has some different materials, not a big deal. Like I'm not trying to manufacture this thing and sell it, but yeah, I kind of went through that with that. And I was just like, man, people are ruthless sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not the only one on that one either. I, I mean, I, I can probably say that two, maybe three days out of the week, on a bunch of different uh, fly tying pages, um, I see something similar to lunch money and um, somebody posts it and everyone comes in and attacks and I'll sit there for an hour and just read and read. And I'm like, I got to stop this, man. This is so bad. And I feel bad for the people. <laughs> like I get, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of people beginning. I mean, especially when you start out, I feel like you may not know the name, you may not know, you know, the person that designed it and maybe it did come to you randomly or maybe you saw something and it gave you an idea. Um, I think, but then again, you know, you'd have, everyone would have to take a minute or two out of their day and ask questions. And I don't think, I, I think we're past that as human. I guess, especially with, with our times now, you know, that things are really weird. Right. But I, yeah. I feel like um, nobody takes the time to recognize like, it was just like you said, Russell, it was, it was completely innocent. You weren't trying to, you know, make a name off of it or anything like that. It was, you know, you were having yeah. a good time in a hotel room after you fished. I mean, what's, what's so wrong about it, but I don't know. It's, it, it's weird. Um, humanity. <laughs> That's all I can say. Humanity, man. It's, you know, yeah. humanity. You, are and you kind of got to shake your head yeah. when you say humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. Well, it's like, I wish it were different, but you know, there's still some good people out there though, man. I mean, some, some really well, oh, sure. well, you know, well known, uh, fly tires themselves and they'll sit there and pat you on the back and, you know, give you ideas or, or try to help you with, you know, anything they can on that end. So, I mean, yeah. as many, yeah. Bad ones as there are out there, I'm sure there's twice as many good ones. So, you know what I one thing that I've really noticed d- doing doing what I've done. I, I've had my fair share of. Can you turn that stupid music off and, <laughs> and stuff like that in, in my videos? So, like thousands of bad comments, you know. But when it comes to like, just like you said a second ago, Marco, like. When it comes to like, if you reached out to Kelly Gallup right. tonight, um, you're probably going to hear back from Kelly. You know, it, it's it, it just the 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 good guys of this sport are like I hate to I hate to say the big names right. because it's just you know, um, and I've 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 been lucky enough to be around so many of them, and, and these guys are so awesome. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you know, I've never. I've never heard like somebody that's that's a, a big name in the sport just completely bash somebody for a fly that they've done. It's always other people that are bashing right. for that person. When yeah. that person's like, oh, God, just let them be. Right. If they're time yeah. flies, you know. So right, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, 100%. there's there's a lot of people out there that are just so negative. 
I mean, hell, you see it. I'm sure you see it. I don't know how often you read your comments, but I've read through some of your comments. I'm like, why are people so negative? Like, you posted a video about um, 10 fly tires that you need to follow on Instagram, right? Uh right? And I can't name how many comments there are. I can't believe you'd make a video without mentioning such and such. And oh. it's like, <laughs> there's, there's thousands of people out there. And he said 10. No. Like, <laughs> not going to name everybody. Uh, but kind of to riff <laughs> off that, I wanted to see if, you know, we could kind of, Go off of that and name some fly tires that Marco and I know mm-hmm. and see if you know them. You already answered one. Matt Bennett was on that list yeah. and you know of him. Oh, yeah. So um, there's kind of a couple others that I wanted to ask you and see if you know of them. So, okay. Um, Game on. They're, they're all, a lot of them are regional uh, to Texas. So that might okay. be a little hint for you. It's Have you Texas. ever heard of Zach Harris? Yes. So dude is a phenomenal Fly Good tire. Man. He's a part of the Honey Hole Angling podcast. Okay. Um, okay. We've had him on the podcast. He's and he ties a lot of carp flies. We were talking about carp fishing okay. earlier. He ties a lot of carp fly. He's like the carp whisperer. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think I named the episode that he was on with us the carp whisperer or something <laughs> like that because dude just he he knows carp and he ties so many flies that are tailored to carp for that reason. Um, so he's one that any of our listeners for some reason if you don't know Zach Harris follow Zach yes. Harris. The other one, <laughs> you know, Fly Geek Matt Matt Bennett. Right. Um, yep. Formerly out of Austin, he is now I think Louis- in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. He? Or Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. Louisiana. Yeah, that was the last one I heard. Um, yeah. I knew he's in a warmer climate or a, a different <laughs> humid, more kind of climate. <laughs> Swampy. Yeah, yeah, more humid for sure. So yeah. <laughs> Flaggy Matt is another one. Um, do you know Chris Koleski? Good man. His uh, Instagram handle is Ditch Fish and Flies. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, I, that sounds familiar. I, I may know more handles really than good. I do. Right? Anything, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So he is no, a that damn good fly tire. So that is another one that I think people should follow. And then another of like these lesser known, there, I, I put two different tiers. Um, kind of somewhat lesser known is Chase Smith, Fish Chase yeah. Flies. Are you familiar with him? Yes. No, I have okay. abs- I absolutely. That dude is phenomenal. Yeah, he is for sure. I phenomenal. have some of his uh, spooks that that he ties up. And, yep. uh, those things, God, it's, uh, you, it, I've never heard of anybody walking the dog, you know, with a fly right. rod before. And those spooks, they're so easy to just get that yep. action as if you were using conventional gear. It's, it's amazing. And then his changers, I know you don't like changers, but his changers are good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I own quite a few of his yeah. game yeah. changers. I mean, even one of his little micro minis out of, I picked it up at Orvis for five bucks and I still have that fly in my box. And then one of the eyes is slowly coming off. Took some super glue to that bastard. I put it right back on there. I was like, throw it right back out. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's still kicking ass, man. It is. It's it's amazing. <laughs> I've landed some weird stuff on that fly too. Just strip, 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 strip. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun to fish this flies. Um, I will ask about that yeah. spook, um, Russell. Those those are uh-huh. hollow body, right? The spiral ones you're talking about, or they're yeah, spiral spook. Yeah. But it's okay. they're, I don't. They're not hollow bodied. Okay. I think it's if I'm not mistaken. I think it's tied with. A, a wrapped foam and then he uh epoxies over do it. you have to yeah. use a it's bigger like, rod to cast those even though they're a little smaller or no no, no. actually they cut through the wind really okay. well uh because there's no fluff it doesn't catch gotcha. wind um so i believe i throw it on my five weight floating line um and it it casts like a dream i might have to um, get some done so yeah and then he oh, ties them in different so sizes cool. as well yeah. so yeah, they're awesome. I have some of the cicada pattern ones, and they're like, and it, I, I don't, I guess he I airbrushes them or something. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, it's like a, it's like black down to orange, mm-hmm. then it has the red eyes on it, like super sick. Well, and then it just has a single hook. Too. Yeah. 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 Yep. It just, yeah, that guy's good. I like that. Yeah, he's really good. So he's another one. And it's crazy because when you look through their, like their follower counts, they, you know, they're all below 5,000. So they're, for some reason, they're not taking off like some of these other accounts, but they're just, yeah. I mean, just all phenomenal fly tires. So I thought I would give them all a little shout out here since, you know, you've done it. I figured I'd ask you. And then two of the most popular ones that are just like hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram. I'm assuming you would know. Um, but have you ever heard of Brian Smith? Brian underscore Smith? ties flies underscore. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, didn't know his name. 200 and something thousand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's another yeah, one. Very crazy. similar handle is she ties flies with the yep. underscores on um, Aaron yep. Hyde. She does like, oh, yeah. it's weird. It's like this hybrid ASMR fly tying. And uh, it's, it's weird because, up. yeah, but she does some freaking awesome flies too. Some of her stuff are like artwork. Like there's no way I would fish it. <laughs> she did a double deceiver on YouTube today. Oh, she did? 
good looking double deceiver hmm. on YouTube. I'd go look today. at that. <laughs> yeah. It was it's a good one. It's a longer video, but yeah, it's a yeah. good looking one. It's got the new Montana Flight Company crazy tails on it. Really? Like they're printing or they're 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 printing like different like very real looking stuff on I'd show you, but I can't. <laughs> I'm not supposed to right now. Yeah. But, right. Uh, so it, she's got she had like the fire tiger one. So they had like uh-huh. tiger stripes on schloppen feathers. Which, really? Yeah. Go check that out. It's super, super cool. That is awesome. <laughs> so is that I don't know much about Montana Fly Company. Is that something that they kind of the leading edge of of stuff like that or uh, I've never seen anybody doing what they do with slopping feathers uh, I see. in particular anyway I like I, they're they're like painting them and and striping them and uh, like all sorts of cool cool stuff it's really really cool they're yeah, expensive I've never heard of anything like that so yeah. I was like you brought it up I was like hmm I wonder if that's they're a thing super, or if they're the ones that are really like kind of starting that yeah that's awesome so yeah Enough about fly tying, although we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but I'm sure we all have stuff to do. <laughs> so your channel is Fly Fish in the Ozarks. So what what is it about the Ozarks to you that you think is so amazing? I could talk about it for hours because I absolutely love the Ozarks, but. <laughs> you know, I think there's more diversity here than what anybody ever would dream of. I mm-hmm. I really, really do. Like you can. You can be uh, me and some buddies sitting around a campfire one night w- with with some bourbon. I'm sure we're just trying <laughs> to figure out how many species within like a a hundred mile radius, mm-hmm. and we I don't even know what number we stopped on, and we just decided to stop <laughs> because <laughs> there was absolutely more. Um, you know the diversity, and and this place is beautiful. Like it is. This is a really, really cool place. And I, I, I just, I, I think there's, there's not many places where you can go and catch as many fish as you want to catch and then go find some really technical fish. And, um, this, it's a really, really cool place and it's easy to get around too. You know, mm-hmm. it's, there's nothing here. It, it's, it's easy to get around. Nothing, yeah. nothing to it. And people there are so it's it's weird to say because I in my adult life I've never had issues making friends until I've moved to Arkansas and I live in in South Central Arkansas Hot Springs so okay people are are friendly but they're not as welcoming you know I'm used to Texas you're floating down the river you bump into somebody's tube and you're like hey man want a beer and next thing you know two weeks later you're hanging out at a family gathering like that's just it's <laughs> what I'm experienced you know my experience has been in a lot of other places whether it be in Georgia Florida Texas like all these places I've been I have no issues making friends and going and doing stuff but in Central Arkansas it's it's kind of different it's not like they're friendly just not as welcoming type of thing and then i go up to the ozarks and i start going up there and, I, and i'm up there probably about once a month now and people are just like like in texas like they're just so welcoming and they're they're willing to share information with you and they're like oh man you've never been here let's help next time you're up let me know and we'll go float this part of the river or we'll go to this lake and it's just people are just so welcoming there it's easy to get around it's gorgeous you got you know palisades in certain areas and then of course you got the saint francis and, and boston mountains and then it's the ozark yeah. plateau so everything's up higher in elevation as it is and it, there's just so much scenery the diversity of wildlife is insane the diversity of diversity of fish is insane as well so yeah i just i absolutely love the ozarks and so you being up there and living up there i just wanted to see what your thoughts were on it yeah that's that's i i think we're on the same page i'm i i I love it here i really really do i there's some stuff that i battle i live in it i live in a small town and i'll battle small town stuff every once in a while (laughs) (laughs) you know on the other side of it it everybody's good and it's just a, it's a it's a great place. I love it. I really do. It is. And so you were talking about. I, I kind of want to roll from that into the community. You know, fly fishing community and stuff like that. You were talking about some of the quote unquote big names in the sport are willing to help one another. And I've noticed that that's just something across the fly fishing community for the most part. Like most people are willing to help. You know, it's it's kind of polar opposites of of tournament bass fishing mentality you know they're like oh i'm I'm not going to tell anybody where i caught this or even what state or what body of water i was on and fly fishermen are like i'm not going to put it out there publicly but you know maybe sometime you and i can go fish it or you know i'll show you this or like we seem to give information a lot more um so is that something that you've experienced as well and and, i mean you've been in the industry for a lot longer than i have 
Yeah. This uh, number one, this industry is tiny. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think people realize how tiny the fly fishing is. Just fly fishing industry, let alone fly tying, because it gets even yeah. way smaller there. Um, it's a tiny industry. The the biggest name in this industry is not a big name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, in the grand scheme of things, very, very tiny. So yeah. so what you run into are are certain companies have had, you know, they pass the same employee from company to company, you know, mm-hmm. and it's a good thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. I, I know, I know several that have been with one company and then went to another company within the same industry. And there, you know, yeah. there's no hard feelings. Um, I, I really can't, I, I really can't name a real bad one. I, I just can't do it. It's just, yeah. I, I think it's pretty cool. I think it is too. It's just, it's crazy how tight the community can be and how helpful it is. And then on top of that, something that we're passionate about is conservation, you know, and there's a lot of other people out there that, you know, from the outside looking in think, oh, well, you know, fly fishermen are the ones like, yeah, we release the fish back in the water. And then you got the other group of people that are like, oh, I'm going to eat everything that I catch. And I feel like there's kind of a misconception on that because fly fishermen care about the conservation and so if it's something you know for instance the smallmouth up there in the ozarks there's the neosho which is its own fish and then there's the northern smallmouth which is its own fish and they're both native there and so whenever they dammed like 10 killer and stuff like that they were hoping the neosho would get bigger and grow grow larger kind of like the northern smallmouth does up in michigan and and stuff like that but that just never happened because it's a different fish and so they're actually talking about possibly changing regulations to uh change the harvest limit down to 14 inches for the smallmouth because um, the Neosho won't ever get above that. So it's going to help out with the Neosho population. So it's stuff like that, that I feel like, you know, fly fishermen in specific seem to care a little bit more about the waterways, about the fish, the quality of the water, the quality of the fish, and, and even some of the lesser known species. So um, is there anything that you know up, you know, in the, in the region of the Ozarks that is more about conservation and whatever species there are up there and any changes? Well, in particularly my home river, uh, the North Fork of the White River is, mm-hmm. is the, the headwaters of North Fork Lake. Okay. okay. So the North Fork of the White River and several other rivers come together to form the headwaters of North Fork Lake. So, um, and in 2017, we had a massive flood, like a, like a, a finger of God flood. We, we really? really did. Yeah, we had 40, somewhere around f- between 40 and 50 feet of water come down the river. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, it was catastrophic. It was three weeks before my wedding. <laughs> wow. And yeah, just like all this stuff. And, but before that flood, uh, the Norfolk of the White was, had very possibly some of the best wild rainbow trout fishing in the Midwest. Really? I'll throw that out there. Um, I'll, I'll say that and I'll stand on it. Uh, the, uh, the, the rainbows in the river hadn't been stocked since like 1965. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, they were wild, you know, mm-hmm. many, many, many generations of wild fish and it was, it was good fishing. This flood decimated them. It, it absolutely decimated them. Um, between that and that we have, we have stripers that have moved into the river because of, of some changes that have been, that have been made downstream between the lake and the river. And um, so, yeah, conservation right now is, is on a massive kick with me. We, we very recently, we've been, we've been trying to work with Missouri department of conservation to, to help the river a little bit. It needs something. Um, it, It can't go from being, you know, a, a major destination river in the Midwest to, you know, I have people asking me if there are still fish in it at all. So, right. um, you know, we, we, you know, we're on this, we're on this, this razor's edge of, you know, we, do you stock, do, do you stock this river and, and, and take away <clears throat> that yeah. 50 years plus, well plus of wild, rainbows doing their own thing. They had their ups and downs. I mean, in the nineties, yeah. they got down to teens per mile. 
Wow. And um, uh, with low water and stuff like that. So, and then they came back and we, we, we had phenomenal fishing in t- 2015. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're on this, 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 like I said, we're on this razor's edge of, of do we really want them to, to stock fish, stock rainbows in particular, they stock brown trout. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Um, but do we want them to touch the rainbows? Do we want them to take our rainbows and, and go breed them and stock them back in our river. So yeah, we're there's, I hope I wish there was more studying being done in particular Mm -hmm. by MDC on this. Um, I don't want to be a a thorn in their side by any means. We're not. I really do. I I would, I wish there was a biologist every day on that river, (laughs) Right. but you know, it, it just can't happen. But so that's, 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 near and dear to my heart big time like uh, one of my buddies that 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 owned a a lodge in, or a, a an outfitter on the river um him and I had the conversation very recently about how you know we kind of after that flood happened we kind of hit this almost like depression of of it you know we didn't realize it but it was like it was crazy because we didn't want to fish you know, mm-hmm. I mean, our, our river was gone and we were hurt and we've got the white river, the white river. <laughs> like, it's 30 minutes from my door, yeah. you know? And, and, it, and it was like, we just, we just kind of threw our hands up and we we're just like, ah, you know, and, and it's crazy yeah. and it can't, it can't stay that way mm-hmm. and it won't, yeah. it won't be that way. I hope, I hope by the time my kids are, are my age that the, the river has st- at least really started to roll to come back and, and be a yeah. good fishery again. But I honestly truly believe it'll probably be about that long. As bad really? as it sounds, but so yeah, we'll did see. it basically just wash everything off the, off the banks and like, like what, what kind of damage physically was done from the flood? Everything. Um, really from just wiped out. But yeah, basically for almost, you could almost say from hillside to hillside on the river Valley, it was, it was, it was like a war zone. It was so bad. Like and <laughs> when you, when you're on one river, as much as I've been on this river, like, like I said, I guided on it for 20 years and mm-hmm. um, nobody could take a picture of a big brown trout on the river without me knowing exactly where it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you give me one rock. You, it, you guys are, I, I, again, I'm going to say you guys are probably too young, but you've heard of name your name, that tune. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. I need, I need one note. I need like, <laughs> I need one note for any place on that river. And I know where that fish was caught. Um, it, it went from that to at, right after the flood, the first, my first float after the flood, if you had blindfolded me and put me in what used to be my favorite fishing hole, I wouldn't have known where I was. Really? Yeah. That's, That's how crazy. bad it was. I, I literally would have, and it was an island. I would have had wow. no idea where I was. And I, if somebody held a gun to my head and tell me and, and forced me to say where I was, I would have been wrong. I would have had really? no idea. That's, That's how bad it tough. was. So what, yeah. what caused the flood? Massive rain. Really? Like, so it wasn't like a, a, an upstream dam breaking or anything like that. It was just no, up, that much I, rain. Yep, it was all rain. It was wow. one. Well, I say one event. It was. It was. It, it was a. It was a perfect storm of 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 a of a pretty soaked watershed and mm-hmm. a storm that that dropped uh, like almost. I don't want to say. I don't, don't want to say hurricane type rain, but pretty close to hurricane type rain and in one spot right in the right on the upper part of our watershed. So yeah. It, it, yeah. It came down. And it, that was in 2017. It, you said 2017, our, our gauge, our, our gauge, the, the gauge that tells us how much CFS is running the river, stuff like that. Uh, it maxed at 180,000 CFS. Holy crap. And that's when that's it just, that's just when it broke. Wow. So uh, we don't, we don't know how much, and it was at 42 feet when it broke. So between 42 and 50 feet, it, this, this is what came down and houses and it, it decimated the whole area. It really, yeah. really did. And it was just, that's insane. it was bad. It was, it was bad. I wonder if that's the same system that hit Texas. So Texas had, 
if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was three years in a row starting in 2015. There was a Memorial Day flood and there was a Halloween flood and then there was a Memorial, another like near Memorial Day flood. And I think the first one was a hundred year flood. The second one was classified as a 500 year flood. And the third one was a hundred year flood back to back to back. And I lived really close to the Blanco river at that time there in San Marcos, Texas. And I mean, it just, it, uh, there was houses floating down the river. I think it rose 54 feet in elevation. I 35 had never been underwater and it was underwater. I mean, completely decimated. Blanco section went over the bridge. I remember that driving by there and I was like, man, what the hell? I've never seen anything like it. You know, wild. It was nuts. Yeah, we lost and I, I knew that river as well. Like I, I knew it like the back of my hand. And when mm-hmm. I went down there after the, I believe it was the second flood, um, I went down there and even the shape of the river was completely yep. different. You know, spots where there was holes before were no holes. Spots where there was islands, there was no islands. Spots where there was like a bluff with trees was just, I mean, gone. Like nothing was the same. It was, yeah. it was nuts. We lost an island and gained an island in the same exact spot. Wow. Really? This river. It was kind of crazy. Insane. Like, like, and it was one of the really, really good fishing spots too. It just called cave riffle. The people that, that know the river will know exactly where I'm talking. And it was an Island, but it, the, it cut a new Island around that Island. And it, when we lost the Island, it was just, it was crazy. That water is incredible. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. That's, that's insane. So have you been back to that, that river and fished it much since? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's my home river. It's, it's, it's my home river. We, we (laughs) fish, we, we still fish the stripers. We fish, we still fish the stripers pretty hard. Um, uh, but you know, and we'll never not float it. I mean, my, my wife and I floated every chance we get, uh, we're, we're on it dozens and dozens of time a year. That's awesome, man. Striper. That's one thing I've targeted striper one time and it, it was like, they were there by happenstance. It was on the Washtenaw River here, and I didn't know that they would even go as far up the river as they were. And uh, I was at the, I had, had a great day fishing so far. I caught my personal best smallmouth, caught a bunch of smallmouth, caught some largemouth, some spotted bass. I ended up catching like a four foot gar and in the same hole that I there. I mean, there was massive catfish, and there was gar, and there was big smallmouth, wow. big largemouth, all in this one hole. And then I heard this huge splash, and I looked, and I was like, that was probably gar. And then I, I cast it out and I saw a gar swimming with like a catfish in its mouth sideways. And I was like, I'm going to cast out a little pink clouds around. I was like, I'm going to cast out it and see. It was like a five foot gar too. It's like, I'm going to cast out and see what I can do. So I cast just past it and I'm stripping it. And then I see the shadow come up and like kind of side swipe it and follow and go back down. And I was like, I didn't look like gar behavior, but it was big. It was like three foot long. And so I cast it right at that gar again, and then it followed right up to my kayak. And it was a striper about as long as my arm. And I was like, that's a striper. And I didn't even know that they were in there. And then I look over to my left, and I see another one, and they're chasing shad. And it comes completely out of the water, lands on the muddy bank, starts flopping around, and gets back in the water. I'm like, that's definitely a striper. And they were just going crazy. And so I was there mainly fishing for smallmouth, so I didn't really have anything too big. And so I found the biggest fly that I had that imitated shad, and I cast it and cast it and cast it. And I was using my <laughs> my five-weight floating line. I didn't have any sink line with me, and uh, my shoulder was killing me. And, and I got so many follows that day, didn't get them to take, but they were curious. They'd come up or they'd sideswipe it and, and not hit. And uh, that's the only time I've ever targeted them. But ever since then, I'm like, oh, I need to get on one so bad. <laughs> they are so cool. We We've had... We, there's I, I I laid eyes on a fish that I I, I hate this I don't even want to say how big <laughs> I, I've never said it and I won't <laughs> because it sounds stupid <laughs> like, mind boggling striper yeah just a huge like an absolutely massive fish I almost put my oar on it I was I was I was actually guiding and my my fisherman was fishing on the left side of the boat which was the good water side of the boat. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> and on the right side of the boat was just bad, flat, blah water. And I, I look over and drop my oar into the water and this fish rolled and took off. And it, I was like, it was the size of me. It was, a, oh, it was wow. me <laughs> around. And I was just like, I didn't know whether to tell my fisherman or not. Cause he was fishing on the completely <laughs> opposite side of the boat <laughs> as the biggest striper yeah. I had ever seen. But, yeah, we have some cool ones and they're, they are, when, when they are, f- when they're fun to catch, they're fun to catch, but they stay in yeah. there in the Norfolk of the white. They'll stay in from 
sometime around Labor Day to they'll start to leave sometime around now. I uh, see. Yeah. And, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them in there and overnight they'll all be gone. Hmm. Just all of them. What do you, it's the craziest. What do you think that? I've never seen, I've no, never seen that happen okay. with any other kind of fish. That's one fish that I have. It, they are, no, they are super sensitive to I mean, temperature I, I, or I pressure or luck. something. It's, um, it's pretty incredible. I've seen them in the quad. Um, but just, haven't made the attempt to go and actually target them, which I've caught on conventional, uh, Lake Whitney and they were a lot of fun to chase. I mean, on conventional, I, we even ran into, to them feeding on top water and we we're just hitting them with a bunch of poppers. That was a lot of fun. But, uh, also I was making 40, 50, 60 foot shots with a conventional rod, you know, and good luck trying to make that with a fly rod. Um, I maybe could on a good day, but I wouldn't uh, put my bottom dollar on it. That's for damn sure. <laughs> so it's like yeah <laughs> yeah that there's something about those temperate bass is they're you know same you know whites hybrids and striper they're, they're yeah. there and then they're gone especially during the white bass run i mean they'll be up there by the thousands and then you go tomorrow not you don't see one it's just yep. crazy how they disappear like that they're super neat fish yeah they are for sure we get a lot of them there's some massive striper up here on lake washita yep. and i mean for lake sure. washita is, is such a, a clean lake and uh, there's a bunch of guides out here that you know run down riggers and stuff to catch them um but i just i want to get on one on the fly rod. there's actually a guy can't remember his name i think he runs bluff line media or something like that that, that uh-huh. made yep. a kind of like a documentary video of him uh fishing on lake washita for striper yeah. and i think that was yep. the first thing the first time i'd ever heard of people fly fishing for striper mm-hmm. and i was just like oh i want to do it so bad <laughs> yeah i actually filmed with him um, you did yeah i don't That's know awesome. i don't know when uh, there may be a, a hiccup on on something coming out but we made a pretty cool video i, I hope to hope to see it sometime pretty soon that's awesome yeah <laughs> yeah i've uh I, I aspire to be able to make films like like I, i'm assuming it's a team that does bluff line or maybe it's just him but what whoever it is it is i mean phenomenal like yeah. <laughs> i aspire he's, to be like that someday yeah he's good and and um when him and i filmed together well him and i and and chad johnson and steve daly and um mm-hmm. a couple other guys all filmed and um he had he had another camera but I mean, that was, it was mostly, mostly him. And he's, and really? he's just such a good guy. He's just a good guy. That's awesome. Well, if uh, you know anything on that video coming out, let me know. Cause I would love to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're kind of coming up close to our time. So is there any upcoming projects or, or any goals that you have for your channel that you'd like to talk about before we got, start getting ready to close it out? You know, um, I, I'm I'm st- I'm gonna bring back like like we talked earlier. I kind of said something about the the drops. I'm bringing back the fly drops. It's been a little while since I did it, and I've really had the urge to do it lately. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm all amped up and excited about it. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna end up doing several several colors of double deceivers over the especially over the winter. Yeah. And um, what I what what I kind of plan on doing what I did with this one is I came up with color combos. And then I had like my channel members and like Patreon members vote on which one was going to be done. So I see. It, it's, it, so it's, it's kind of a cool project kind of for everybody. And uh, so I've, I still have several colors that only the channel members have seen. Mm-hmm. So I, I, there's, there's going to be a lot coming out there um, on the video side of things. Um, I hope to kind of finish. I had started a, a video on design or a video series on designing a fly. Like from, from, I went from drawing it because I had this fly in my head. It was a single hook fly, um, all the way to tying it. It was like a Uh three or four part series and stuff like that. Um, it's super cool. I haven't finished that fly yet and that's going to be coming up. That's there's some stuff that's going to be coming up with, with finishing that series and, and moving on from there. So yeah, we, we always have stuff in the quiver. Nah, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, keep your eyes out for that. So I, I mean, kind of, I don't want to like go into another tangent, but I have to real quick. So I saw you did a video, I guess it was probably maybe a year, year or so ago that you did. Um, it was like sketch to catch type thing. Oh yeah. So how did that come about? Cause that is like a crazy idea that I thought was really freaking cool. 
It's super cool. So, um, uh, I think it's lakes, rivers, and streams. Uh, okay. he's, he's an artist on Instagram and he actually just started a new one. It was the first time he had done the sketch to catch. And, and I thought, man, that'd be cool to make a whole video on. So, so right. I, I, I did, I made the whole video on that. What he usually does is uh sketch to vice. And he actually I just see. did a brand new one, like yesterday or day before he did like a Kaufman stone. Uh, this guy is an artist and he's phenomenal. He's so good. He has, like shirts and caps and like maybe playing cards. He's got all sorts of stuff and he's really, really good. So yeah. when he does a, a, a drawing of something, he'll do a contest of to, to see who can tie it as close to his drawing and stuff like that. And I see. So, and so, yeah, that's really cool. And it's so funny that you brought that up because I think it's been a while since he did a sketch to vice. And he, mm-hmm. like I said, he just did one within the last like 48 hours. I swear. It really? Was. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You said lakes, rivers, that and streams. Was fun. That was super, super cool. And I hope he, I, I hope he sees this and I hope he goes, he brings back the sketch to catch. Cause that was tons of fun. Yeah, dude. It looked like so much fun. That's something I was like, well, if he don't bring it back, I might reach out to him and be like, Hey man, can we do something like that? Or maybe partner with him, you know, because I go. feel like that would be like, for one, a great way to get interaction with your, your listeners, followers and stuff like that. But secondary to that, it, right. it's just, it, it's a great idea. And it just seeing something in conception exactly. from a drawing to a vice to a fish, like the, it's the whole process yeah. <laughs> from, yeah. from, from an idea to the end goal is all done. Yeah. So yeah, that is <laughs> freaking so awesome. Fun. That, on, on my end of it, it was, right. I had so much fun with it. As soon as he, as soon as he dropped that out there, I, I knew. I was going to make a video on that. It was just yeah. like, yeah, that's an easy one. I'm definitely making that. Video. <laughs> that <laughs> and I like awesome. doing that stuff. I really do. Yeah. I, I would like to do more of, of that, get out of the studio type of stuff and, yeah. and do it. I, I don't yeah. think I'll ever go back to doing so many fishing videos just because I enjoy fishing now. <laughs> and you know, um, but yeah. I need to, I, yeah. I know I have had so many people hounding me about bringing back, fishing video. So I need to start doing that again. And I, I probably will at some point, but, um, right. as of right this second, uh, after I quit guiding, I was like, I don't want to really do that as much anymore. I just want to fish. Yep. And yeah, I so. don't blame you there, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll bring it back. I like shooting video yes, too much to not bring them back. Right. Right. See, and that's how I feel. It's like, I, it's hard to find the balance between enjoying doing the activity and filming because you never know when or where the fish is going to hit. So it's hard to actually capture it. So you got to, you have to keep it in the back of your mind on how I'm going to capture this. But at the same time, you know, you, you want to enjoy what you're doing out there and it's hard to find the balance between the two for sure. I definitely get that. That's what's, that's what's kept me away from GoPros. Honestly. I mean, even my wife's like, man, you should get a GoPro, get your GoPro for Christmas. It's like, it's not that I don't want to spend the money. It's just, I don't, it's one other thing you have to worry about. Right. right? Yeah. It's like, you got to make sure it's on you. You got to strap it on. You got to put it onto your hat. And I just, I want to take in the moments. And, um, I've done, I've done too many trips where I didn't take in the moment and I let my own stress or whatever I had going on, you know, in my life at the time kind of blind me from the beauty that I've been able to see out on some of these rivers or, you know, fishing the flats and whatnot. And, um, it's, it's, it's wild to me, you know, I almost feel like I haven't done enough, but then I think back on it. I'm like, I have done a lot, yeah. well, you know, just, it's not that I don't appreciate it. It's that I kind of blinded myself and I'm, I'm tired of doing that. And this year kind of hit me. I'm like, you need to stop that. You need to take everything in. So chances are, I'm probably not going to go GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> I didn't want to do it before. I don't want to do it more now. So, right. Yeah, it's, it's it's definitely hard to find that balance, but uh, yeah, we look no, forward absolutely. to seeing some from you, Brian. So <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But it's it's been a pleasure having you on, man. Uh, I mean, I feel like we could just talk for hours and hours and hours, but unfortunately, oh, yeah. we do have a time limit, and I know we both have lives. So, uh, but it was great having you on. We appreciate your time, and uh, you're welcome on yeah. again at any time if you ever have anything you want to push out or tease or uh, just you know, hop on to shoot the crap. I mean, we're, we're more than happy to have awesome. you on. And yeah. unfortunately he'll say wasn't able to make this episode. And I know he's regretting that. So maybe we can get on for another episode someday. <laughs> yeah. We go. trade, uh, yeah. we, we usually trade one Mex one bearded Mexican for another. So we're good. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I'm always here to take up that mantle for him at any point in time. Then, uh, Brian, what, what's your Instagram handle? 
It's fly fishing the Ozarks. Fly fishing the Ozarks. I'll make sure yep. to give you a follow. Everyone out there, give them a follow. Yep. And we'll put Good your man. links in the description and stuff like that. And uh, for those of y'all that are mm-hmm. watching, we appreciate y'all making it to the end. And we'll catch y'all next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.